deprecatory prayers and uh, imprecatory, imprecatory was, prayers. And uh, I was just wondering, he was he was really trying to caution people against one of them, and he like went into examples. So I was just wondering. The precatory prayers would be a major exorcism. So those would be ones the commands given to the demon, and those are prayers that the church says that only the priest authorized by his bishop should say those. So only the exorcist should be giving commands to demons. But again, the other part would be those supplicating prayers, prayers that address to God that anyone could do. And in the ritual itself, there are examples of these prayers that are directed to God. God, see how your servant is suffering. Come to their aid and deliver them from the evil that's afflicting them. Any of us can say that, but to say to the demon, I command you, I bind you, the church says we really need to be not doing that because uh, we could be getting ourselves into trouble. Even Cardinal Rotzinger, the future Benedict XVI, in the mid-1980s, cautioned against prayers to God, which anyone may say, and commands to demons, which are reserved to the bishop or the priest that he is authorized to give those commands. I would say that there are some people that would say that they have the right to give those commands by virtue of their baptism. But again, if you're trying to defeat evil by being, being disobedient to the local bishop, disobedience and fighting the devil don't go hand in hand, a recipe for disaster. Role-playing, like D&D &D games that a lot of young people play for, I think, I'm, I've never played it myself, but I think they enter into, like, personalities of forces and spirits and and there's a danger to that again because we think that it's fun and entertaining but again it can be a subtle way that the devil is trying to get a foothold into our lives you know the devil is not on any timeline he's not in any hurry but his goal is to destroy our lives and so he can do that through role playing and, and whatnot again because it glamorizes evil we start to think that it's fun and entertaining, but then we start to take on the persona of that character that we're portraying. And what identity should we only have? It's our, with our relationship with Christ. That's the only identity that should truly matter. Think of John 3.30. He must increase and I must decrease. When we engage in these types of activities, Christ is decreasing and the evil one is increasing. What would the, uh, I guess, implications be for St. John Vianney, uh, who is tormented by demons basically his entire uh, priestly life? So what were the, I guess, yeah, implications surrounding that uh, attack? So saints of the church that are afflicted by evil, you mentioned St. John Vianney. We can think of St. Pio, Padre Pio. We think of St. Paul himself the messenger from Satan sent to torment him to keep him from becoming proud. Think of Job in the Old Testament. These are examples of what I would call demonic oppression. Oppression. So God is permitting someone to be tormented by evil as a gift. Now, you might think, is there, did that come with a receipt? Can I take it back? Can I exchange it? But God does allow people to be oppressed by evil as an opportunity for people to show their fidelity to God. Because certainly St. John Vianney did not need an exorcism. It was because of his sanctity and holiness that the devil afflicted him. Padre Pio, there's a little book called The Devil in the Life of Padre Pio. He used to call the devil Old Bluebeard. That was his nickname for the devil. And in that book, Padre Pio writes that one night when he was sleeping, you know, the devil came and was making all kinds of noise in his room, preventing him from getting any sleep so that the next day he wouldn't be able to greet the pilgrims who came to see him or hear their confession. And he said he rolled over and looked over and said, oh, it's only you, old Bluebeard. I thought it was somebody important. And then he rolled over and went back to sleep. It's a great attitude all of us should have, right? Oh, it's only you. I always say the devil's like a cockroach. You flip on the light, and what does the cockroach do? It scurries for the closest crook or, you know, crevice that it can hide in. And what's the light that we throw? 
the light of Christ onto the devil through this particular prayer and ministry of the church. Um, so my dad told me one time that like pieces of jewelry can be cursed. So we have a lot of like, me and my sister have like a lot of jewelry in our room. If a piece of jewelry happened to be cursed or something and we didn't know it, if we got the house blessed, would that take care of it? It would be, because the question would be, if an object is cursed, is it inherently evil? Now, you know, if the jewelry was manufactured to glorify some demon, then yes, it's inherently evil. But if it's just like a, a general ring, then blessing it is good enough. So you're taking it out of the profane, if you will, and putting it in the sacred. But the question would be, is the object inherently evil? If so, it should be destroyed, such as a Ouija board, for example. But if it's an object that's simply been cursed, it could be blessed and then used. Because again, think for a moment, people that are possessed, we don't think we're, we should destroy them. No, we're going to bless them, if you will, through this particular prayer of the church. I had a question about yoga, actually, because I know a lot of people will use that, or what you thought about that, because I know a lot of people will use that as a form just for stretching or for, I don't know if, that, if, they're, actually, if they're practicing it or they're just trying to use it to stretch, become more flexible, but I was curious what you thought about that. So the practice of yoga, the church does caution against that. You know, the word yoga is associated with yoke. So what is one yoking themselves to? And the church says that oftentimes, for the majority of people, they may not be able to separate the physical exercise from the prayers that are associated, the spirituality that's associated with it. Because even the different postures within yoga are different prayer postures for the different deities within Hinduism. So the danger would be maybe somebody begins simply for the physical benefit, but then they may get intrigued by the spirituality that's tied to it. So if one needs to exercise, I think there's a lot of other good ways to do that rather than adopting a spiritual practice that really doesn't have any Christian roots to it. I was just wondering um, what you thought about the like unbound um, books by Neil Lozano and healing deliverance ministry stuff that he does. That's a good question. So like books like Unbound. So in the world of exorcism, we would, what is an exorcism? There are exorcism prayers, there are deliverance prayers, and prayers for inner healing. And the Unbound prayers by uh, Neil Lozano are prayers for inner healing recognizing that people may have experienced some brokenness in their life. They grew up in a dysfunctional home. Maybe someone was an alcoholic, addicted to drugs, whatever it might be, and then trying to help the person deal with that brokenness that they, they experienced. So inner healing, deliverance, exorcism. My questions are quick and short. I think I have two. Uh, what do you think of the Harry, Harry Potter series? Harry Potter, I would say that's the type of literature that's catechetical in nature. Again, young people are going to read these types of books. So to me, just telling young people not to read it, not to watch the movies isn't enough. But again, our Catholic parents sitting down with their children and talking about that type of literature and how it's inconsistent with our faith. So you can't tell young people today, perhaps, don't read that, don't watch that. But parents could use that as a teaching moment for their children to say, why is this inconsistent with our Catholic beliefs? Their danger, though, or the reality is that many young people are picking up Harry Potter books, but when's the last time they picked up the Bible or the Catechism of the Catholic Church? Again, if there was a good balance, you would be able to filter this type of literature through our faith to know what's inconsistent with it when it comes to our relationship with God. Okay. And my, my last one is uh, essential oils. What's your opinion on those? Yeah, the, the, I would say that in the world of exorcism, the jury seems still to be out on essential okay. oils, you know, whether or not, because you find them in just about everything today. And I know that it's a question. The International Association of Exorcism is, that's why we the other year to address 
topics like this that come up and what should be the church's response to all of that. Because again, essential oils you can find in things you drink. It can be in air fresheners. It's, they're everywhere. And, and I would put pornography under the, the heading of life of habitual sin, addictive behavior that just becomes the norm. So I would say that it can be. And, you know, I think pornography has been on the rise because of technology. It's at people's fingertips today. And as a result, I think it's the devil uses that. Again, the devil is an opportunist. He will use any means that he can to try to unravel our lives and addictive behavior, whether it's pornography, drugs, or alcohol, whatever it is, the devil can use that to destroy our lives. As far as what you said concerning entertainment, I've seen a lot of adaptations through entertainment concerning like God, angels, demons, and I've noticed they've been seriously messing up people's perception of how angels and demons work. And um, what advice could you give on like how to properly educate people about stuff like this and how angels and demons really work? Yeah, that's a very good thing because I think the question is about angels. Most people have some type of sentimental view of angels. Sometimes you even hear somebody dies tragically. People will say, they're my angel in heaven. Well, people don't become angels. I know people are grieving. They're looking for some sense of consolation. But it is important for us to understand the nature of angelic creatures, what they're capable of, what they're not capable of. And uh, yeah, we should do that. I could... I won't elaborate anymore. I could go into a little discussion on St. Thomas Aquinas. But again, it is important, I think, for us to understand the angelic nature, what they're capable of, because it gives us a deeper insight into the world of demons and what they're capable of and what they're not capable of. What should we know about animal possessions? As in, we hear in the Bible about demons requesting to be sent into animals, and then there are saints who, like I think it was Padre Pio, who was attacked in a, during his childhood by a black dog. Mm -hmm. And so how does animal possession happen, and what are the signs of that? Is it similar to how humans can get possessed? Animal possession would be infestation. So that would be under the category a location, an object, or it would be even an animal. So an animal would be an infestation. Because obviously the animal isn't doing anything to invite the demon in. So it comes about because in the example of Jesus sending the demons into the swine, that's what God permitted. And it could happen because maybe somebody is using an animal in some type of satanic ritual or practice. What is your opinion of like Catholic uh, media creators who are trying to compete with the secular world and trying to create like alternatives to uh, to like the Harry Potter series and stuff like that? Like Tol people writers like Tolkien mm -hmm. who still manage to write magic sis magic systems. And what is your opinion on doing that to make it? not the occult, but kind of show that through our made in the image of God that we can, we can sort of have power that comes from God, like how the saints are, mm -hmm. how the saints still can do amazing things like bilocate and levitate and, some sorts of, and those sorts of things. I think types of, types of literature that are leading people to God are, are good and they're wholesome. Again, they can be a good response to those types of literature that are glamorizing evil. So I would say that those are very positive things if they're helping people to think about their faith and to grow in their relationship with God. So you mentioned the Latin prayers. Um, I was wondering if you can talk more about that, whether if they're more powerful than saying a Hail Mary in English. So the question, is Latin more efficacious than English? Yes. It, and for me, it's not the language, it's the prayers themselves. So in the new rite, when it came out in 1998, people said that the prayers didn't seem to be very powerful compared to the way that if you translated the old rite into English, it seemed to be more powerful, if you will. 
That's why it was tweaked again in 04 and 05. I think when we have debates about language and whatever, the devil just really enjoys that because ultimately it's the prayer of the church. And if it's the prayer of the church, that's all that should matter. I knew an exorcist one time who was using the new rite and he said that the demon manifested and said, you're not gonna try to get rid of me with that translation, are you? And so he said he stopped using the new rite. And so I asked him and I said, if the devil is the father of all lies, why would you believe anything that came out of the mouth of that person that was manifesting evil? So I think the devil enjoys it when we argue over language and whatnot, because what really matters is, is it the prayer of the church and the holiness of the person that's praying? Because if I'm not in the state of grace and I'm doing an exorcism, I'm vulnerable to demonic attacks myself. So if you think about the lives of the saints, what's always around the saint's head, it's a halo. Whose glory are they radiating? Their own? No, they're radiating the glory of God. So a priest in the state of grace doing an exorcism should be radiating the glory and the presence of God in that prayer of the church. And again, you know, in the sacramental life of the church, the personal character of the priest doesn't matter. If the priest is not a good guy, he performs a wedding, the people are still married. If he celebrates Mass, it's still the body and blood of Christ. But in an exorcism, that's not the case. So I really need to make sure that I'm in the state of grace. And I've known exorcists not in the state of grace, which is why when they performed an exorcism, it did not come to an end because the demon did not have to obey them because of their own sinfulness, which they were not owning up to. What if you've, um, you've worked or work in a place where uh, your coworkers do activities like uh, ghost hunting and they look for ghosts or spirits and, uh, and then other coworkers tell you, oh, in this place, there's, you, you sense weird phenomena or you feel like someone's here although you're the only one there, right? Should you, my thought was just to go and bring holy salt, but what, what would be other solutions? Uh, like ask a priest to bless it. Uh, how would, what would you do in that situation? A few years ago, I was on vacation. Some of my family, I have six brothers and two sisters. We were in Savannah, Georgia, and we were out walking one evening, and all these people were getting on a bus to go on a ghost tour. I told my one sister that I was going to go on the tour and take holy water with me and just bless everywhere. She laughed and she goes, you're going to put them out of business. The thing about evil in a location is that we would say that demons, because they're pure spirit, are neither here nor there. We say they're here or there if they're choosing to act in a location. So a demon doesn't live in an abandoned house. It could be the very thing the ghost hunter is doing that's attracting the attention of the demon that's causing it to manifest there. But demons don't have an address like we do because they're pure spirit. So it's the activities of the ghost hunters that could actually be causing the manifestations to happen. And any exorcist will tell you about 99% of the time, these are not spirits of those who have died that are there. They are demons that are playing with these people trying to get into their heads. I was watching a show one night and flipped over to another channel. A ghost hunter show was ending, and the ghost hunter said, okay, I'm leaving now, whatever's here, do not follow me home. I don't want you in my house. You stay here and leave me alone. It's kind of a crazy statement again, because demons want connections with humans because they want to destroy our lives. So they're not just gonna live in, a, in a, an abandoned house somewhere. They're going to be looking to, for ways to connect with us so that they can cause our lives to unravel. And I think fascination with ghost hunting and all of that, I put that under that category of entertainment again. We may think it's fun and entertaining, but we are giving the devil a foothold in our life. Um, I was wondering if uh, you could maybe list off some prayers that are appropriate for the laity to use if they feel like they're maybe um, experiencing spiritual attack or maybe are there any prayers that we may not know about that we may be able to use as lay people? 
if, if people tell me that they believe they're being afflicted and don't need an exorcism, usually these people will email me and then I will send them prayers out of here because the new rite of exorcism has prayers in it that people can pray on their own behalf. Now, like I said, you can't go and buy a copy of this, but uh, again, there are prayers that people can say. I was looking for a sample example. O oh God, protector of those who hope in you, take up buckler and shield and rise up and come to my help. Set me free from the snares of the enemy and with your power fight those who fight against me. Through Christ our Lord, amen. I think there's some good examples of deliverance or spiritual warfare books that are out there, but when people contact me, I send them copies of prayers out of the ritual itself that they can pray on their behalf. My uh, family had a parish priest one time tell us that the St. Michael prayer shouldn't be prayed alone, that you should pray in a group of people. Um, what are your thoughts on that, the St. Michael the Archangel prayer, praying it alone? Well, you know, the prayer was given to us by Pope Leo XIII. It used to be prayed at the end of every Mass. It does say us, so it's meant to be a communal prayer. Um, I think if a person, I don't see any personal, I don't see any danger for somebody if, you're, if in a moment you're afraid or something and to offer that prayer, I think it can be very powerful. But again, it is meant generally to be a communal prayer. It's like the Our Father. We don't say, my Father who art in heaven. But there are times that we say that prayer by ourselves too and I think that's okay as well. Thank you very much, Father. Um, abortion and the demonic and we many I mean probably most of us if not all of us have experienced some um, per periods of varying times of the no access to the sacraments during this sort of pandemic and wondered if you could talk about that yeah well, I think I think the devil is taking advantage of the pandemic because we weren't allowed to go to church we weren't allowed to celebrate the sacraments. We lost a sense of community. You know, there are many people that, you know, you can watch Mass on television, but it's not the same thing. My parish, we offered, uh, we got one of those radio transmitters that works within 300 yards so people could sit in the parking lot and listen on the 88.7. But again, I think the devil took advantage of that just to isolate us even further. And... Uh, the challenge the church is going to face is what's going to bring people back? And that's the question that's now being asked by priests and bishops is when people stop coming and even when we told them they didn't have to come, what's going to bring them back? Because most people will develop new patterns after th three months and there's a lot of people, some people even told me that we don't plan to come back to church, you know? We found new ways to pray on our own. We don't really see the, the value of church anymore. So the church is going to be challenged in what it can do. And then you talked about abortion, and I think the devil loves abortion because we're killing ourselves. We're killing the next generation. Thanks maybe we can end with a prayer. Today is the feast of the archangels, so maybe we can say together the St. Michael prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. St. Michael, the archangel, defend us in battle. Be our safeguard against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the heavenly host, by the power of God, thrust into hell Satan and all the other evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls, amen. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.